people introduced, but the union movement has some concerns with uh, um, some privacy issues. Uh, we do, though, have uh, security checks done for anyone who works on the airports in Australia. But uh, sort of asking that question, um, I can uh, tell you an interesting story about uh, one of the uh, first announcements I made as a union official. I was uh, at, at, at the Australian Senate, a Senate inquiry into the sale of Qantas. And it had been reported to me from many of our members who had worked uh, in Singapore uh, that there was one thing that was concerning them about the aircraft that were sent up there, and that was uh, the fact that prior to maintenance, the aircraft has the undercarriage cleaned and all that. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, maintenance provider was actually using uh, using prison labour from Changi Prison to carry out that work. And I, I announced that uh, I announced that uh, in Canberra, and uh, there was a lot of eyebrows raised, and a lot of reporters wanted to talk to me afterwards. Um, so uh, I think I was uh, I was driving uh, back to Sydney in the car, doing radio interviews all the way, and uh, I ended up debating the head of uh, Qantas maintenance about the issue, and he he assured me that that didn't happen, and was trying to trying to get out of it. Uh, but a few more people come out uh, in the press uh, uh, in the coming days, and he had to do a bit of a backflip, and he said, well, if. Uh, if there were prisoners working on the Qantas planes, it was the Qantas engineers' fault who were up there for uh, not watching our backs. So I think uh, security is a real issue uh, in particular countries. From the FAA perspective, Linda, as far as the inspectors, I mean, is that an integral part of their inspection process when they're over in these foreign repair stations, is looking at the security aspects as well? No. We're concentrating on just getting in there, seeing if the FARs are being complied with. And uh, what we see, we try to pass on, as far as security is concerned, uh, issues. But that is not our mandate. And we have our hands full anyway. <laughs> so, but given the fact that the mandate is for you, the FAA, or the FAA, to ensure the highest levels of safety, how do they do that when security is a safety issue? That's a, it's a good question. <laughs> How can we change the process so that these initiatives are not simply coming from the people with a money interest and that we turn this into a safety issue? Because that has been the fundamental problem from day one. That money will corrupt the issue. How do we change that process? Who wants to take that on? I know you do. But <laughs> oh, from, from the, hold on a second, Steve. From the perspective of being in the position that you're in, being in a, in a high level position, when we make recommendations, we being the NTSB make a recommendation, we don't really look at the dollar value associated with safety because you can't put a price on safety. But how do you answer a question like that where you got to drive that point home that regardless of the cost, you have to implement these safety measures to, to, uh, to further or enhance safety as a whole? We've been talking about Charlotte, but I need to acknowledge that the Safety Board hasn't investigated an accident where foreign outsourcing mm -hmm. has been a problem. And so my comments are mine alone and not necessarily uh, those of the Safety Board. Um, I think the problem for us from the Safety Board's perspective is we, we do feel like we make a lot of good recommendations. And if implemented, we think our recommendations would prevent uh, future accidents from occurring. But we don't have to do what the FAA has to do or corporations or companies have to do, we don't have to look at the dollars. And so we can ask for great technology, we can ask for excessive training, we can ask for a lot of things that we think are important. Um, at the end of the day, I think, unfortunately, as we've seen too many times, it does take an accident in order to change people's minds and change their behavior. It does take a death toll before issues are corrected, uh, changes are put into place. We knew long before Value Jet that we had concerns. Uh, we made recommendations about those. We got a no response from the FAA. They didn't want to do it. After Value Jet, there was some momentum, and they began to change the way things were done. There was an, a clear political interest. There was a clear regulatory interest in addressing them, and things got done. And so I think we've seen that in other accidents. So is it fair to say that, I mean, it, it we always talk about culture and culture shift and trying to get people to, to stem the tide with a better attitude and really take an interest in enhancing safety. But there's always a price for that. Is it possible to basically take 
that dollar figure in this day and age with the, the way the airlines are operating right now, basically on a shoestring, we have these major mergers that are possible. Is there a way to change that culture anytime soon and get maintenance back in house if that's what's necessary or gain better control of the maintenance that's happening out there regardless of what it costs? Is that possible? Well, the safety standard says that, that it's possible, but I would ask the gentleman in the back, because I don't think that anything we say up here, or it's certainly not anything I'm going to say, <laughs> is going to satisfy your question. But, you know, Southwest, JetBlue, th those, those companies, are you, would you say they have to bring their maintenance in-house? I mean, it, it's not going to happen, sir. And those are the kinds of changes. It's a cultural um, shift. We've got regional jets now. We've got a completely different mo models now going on. And I think we can make a difference. And I think what you're saying is that we just need to all keep embracing it and say the same, continue to say the same thing. You know, we're, we're not going to get to the end of the road in one motion. We're going to have to take it step by step. And the first step is develop a set of standards that are applied across the board. And the overseer of those standards has to be the FAA. So they need the resources to do their job. They're going to get some modern technology eventually. The ATOS is going to be improved into an SMS system, but the airlines are going to. because you've got another panel to sit on. <laughs> <laughs> but one step at a time. There's certification standards that the Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE International, is working on to help us with people. You know, we don't, we're not attracting the people in this business. Sarah alluded to it, but I'll give you some numbers that are a couple of years old. That uh, if you reach age 72 and you have an AMP certificate, the FAA just drops you off the rolls, not for any reason other than a head count. So if you ask the FAA how many uh, licensed uh, certificates are out there, they'll tell you 300 and something thousand, and that means licenses are issued to a person who has not yet reached age 72. I'm going to cut you off, John, only because I know that we've well, got some questions two out of time. Two seconds. We're losing 14,000 people a year to retirements on reaching age 72. We're replacing them with 6,000. There's not enough people to go around. We're not filling in behind us. And that, that's a big problem. In the back. Based on your experience with the lack of enforcement, lack of oversight, lack of certifications, background checks, no drug tests, where would you start? If you could walk out of this room today and have something changed, what would it be? Who are you saying that to? Well, you started with your standards. Okay. But continue. That, that's where I would start. You know, we, we have a big turnover in this business, in the repair stations and in the airlines. Big turnover. We need to keep capturing our own people. I gave you that 6,000 people number. Those are not all coming into aviation. Disney World. You know, Six Flags, the list goes on and on of other industries. I, I told a story a minute ago about a, a, a railroad uh, train driver, an engineer they call him. He's not really an engineer, but he drives the train. $100,000 a year job, A&P mechanics in it. The, you go down to Florida, the maritime industry, loaded with A&P mechanics working for boats. Why? Because they bring skills that industry wants, right? Broad-based skills. We need to capture our people. If we get them in the aviation, we need to hold on to them. Even if they come in as, as repairmen or uncertificated people and start working through the process, we need to make sure that we grab them and keep them. Other industries keep them. I mean, we're competing with the computer repair industry. All of us are probably taking our computers to some place to be fixed, and it's a young kid that does it. I mean, my grandson takes my machine apart, and I won't even touch it. I mean, we need to make sure that we capture our people. That's the first standard, I would say. We need the better manuals. We, I wish that how I could have a baseball bat in the FAA. <laughs> you know what? 10% of the maintenance manuals have their procedures validated. And recently, Boeing was bragging that they were going to do 15% on the, on the 787. That's sickening. That is sickening. Every freaking, uh, every word, <laughs> temperature's rising, every, every word in a flight operations manual has been vetted every which way. What's it mean? You know, we heard what, what the meaning of is or does or whatever it was. <laughs> we do that in flight operation manuals. We don't do it in maintenance manuals. And what happens to our people? You use the manual for a little while, you find out the manual is, isn't worth the paper it's written on, then you stop using it across the board. <laughs> Those are the things that we have to fix today because we can. 
that needs to be done. I could go on forever. Yeah,